All right, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome to Do Rivers Affect Winter Survival of the Emerald Ash Borer? My name is Wendy Tremblay, and I am the Community Engagement Manager for Wild Rivers Conservancy um, of the St. Croix and Namakagan. And I'm Alexis Monti, the Climate Resiliency Specialist for Wild Rivers Conservancy. The Conservancy is the official nonprofit partner of the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway, a unit of the National Park Service. The Conservancy inspires stewardship to forever ensure the rare ecological integrity of the St. Croix and Namakagan Riverway. As a nonprofit, we depend on the support of individuals and businesses throughout the watershed to carry out our important mission. If you are inspired by our work today, please consider becoming a donor, volunteering, or participating in one of our many upcoming events. And to those of you who are already supporters, thank you. Before we begin, we'd like to take a few moments to talk about some housekeeping items. To ensure the best video quality, please keep your camera off and remain on mute. This program will be recorded and a link will be sent out to you in the next few days. The recording will also be available to view on the Conservancy's YouTube channel. If you have any questions uh, throughout the presentations, feel free to put them into the chat window at any time during the presentation. And we'll have some time at the end for Rob to answer any of the questions that you have. And did you know that there are four species of ash trees native to Minnesota and Wisconsin? The emerald ash borer, an invasive insect, is a threat to all four species. Um, in today's Lunch and Learn, we will learn more about the role of our riverway um, and how it could play into the winter survival of this non-native beetle. Our presenter today is Rob Vinette. Dr. Rob Vinette is a research biologist with the Northern Research Station, USDA Forest Service in St. Paul, Minnesota, where he leads a research program to protect trees and forests from new invasive species. His research on the cold tolerance of invasive insects, like emerald ash borer, is particularly popular in winters with a polar vortex. He also serves as the director of the Minnesota Invasive Terrestrial Plants and Pest Center at the University of Minnesota where he guides research towards solutions that will protect Minnesota's forests, prairies, wetlands, and agriculture from some of the most threatening non-native invasive insects, plants, and diseases. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rob Vinette. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you, Alexis. Let's get this screen shared. There we go. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And again, I want to thank Wendy and Alexis for the invitation to be here with you today to talk about a subject that actually might be a little sensitive this time of the year. Um, I put up this photo just as a, a little bit of my background. I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota, and we always like to talk about the good old days of what winter really used to be like. And as I travel around the country and talk about the impact of cold on emerald ash borer, I get lots of stories about what winter has done to people throughout the many, many years. But one thing I've always learned is that come March, people are ready to be done with winter. It's time for spring. But sadly, looking out my window today, it uh, looks like Mother Nature is not going to give up quite so easily. Um, so you may be getting flurries where you are too. Or two, um, but it does look like um, we have a little bit more of winter to think about. What I'd like to share with you today is just to do a quick overview of the biology and impacts of emerald ash borer and why we're concerned about it. And then to spend a few minutes just talking about some of my own research on the cold hardiness of emerald ash borer and why that's an important question, particularly for our neck of the woods. And then the bulk of the time I'm really hoping to spend on whether or not the unique climate along the St. Croix could impact that overwintering survival of emerald ash borer. So just as a quick preview, because I don't like to wait to the very end to give you the, the final message is emerald ash borer is a really bad insect and we all have good reason to be concerned about it. Yes, cold can affect 
the survival of uh, emerald ash borer in our part of the of the world. And it also does look like the environment along the St. Croix really does have an impact on some of these winter temperatures and in turn could affect the survival of EAB. But I will also highlight that the effects are kind of inconsistent and uh, probably point to the need for more research. So let's get into it. You may, many of you may be familiar with this uh, very important insect in, in North America. Of course, this is the adult of the emerald ash borer, and it literally has become a poster child for why we're concerned about invasive species. So this is an insect that's not native to North America. It has no natural enemies here. It, the host trees that we have have no resistance. And so when it moves into a forested ecosystem, be that in an urban or a natural environment, its effects are absolutely devastating. We know that this insect is native to parts of Asia. In fact, the insect can go quite far north into China. Uh, the city of Harbin is probably one of the coldest large cities in all of the world, and temperatures there regularly get to minus 40. And so people have often told me, Rob, why are you working on the cold tolerance of this insect? If it can survive minus 40, it's going to survive in most of the United States. Well, it turns out though, some additional work has pointed out that our populations in North America don't come from those extremely cold parts of the world. In fact, it comes from, and I'm hoping you can see my pointer, this area called the Hebei province around Tianjin City. That's a uh, slightly more southerly than those far northern populations. And it suggests that perhaps the EAB that we have may not be as cold tolerant as it is in other parts of the world. But we know that EAB was able to hitch a ride to North America being found in the Detroit area right around 2002. And from there, it's really spread throughout the Eastern part of the continent. Uh, it first showed up in Minnesota in 2009, and since then it's just continued to spread. Both Minnesota and Wisconsin are, are on the leading edge for emerald ash borer, so it's not in every part of either state yet, but its continued movement really is a concern for all of us. And so that purple county in western Minnesota, that's Clay County, the recent find in Moorhead, um, right next door to my, my hometown of Fargo. Uh, the other big find, of course, was at the end of last year, emerald ash borer was found in Oregon for the first time, one of the biggest jumps that we've seen um, in the country. And so that's a huge concern for us, trying to figure out where it might go next. We do know that all ash species, all fraxinus that is, are susceptible to the emerald ash borer. So the most abundant species that we have in Minnesota in particular are the green and black ash, as well as a little bit of white ash. White ash is a little more common in Wisconsin, and Wisconsin will also have a few more blue ash species. Um, but other things like prickly ash are not susceptible to this insect. But once it finds a tree, once emerald ash borer finds a tree, it begins to create these serpentine galleries that you can see uh, pictured here. And those are created as the insect feeds within the phloem beneath the bark and just into the outer hardwood. And doing that enough will begin to kill a tree. So these are the, some of the signs that we look for for infestations of emerald ash borer. Sometimes a, a tree, the bark will naturally split. And if you look into those bark splits, you can actually see the galleries uh, going back and forth. In other places, and this is the, the trick that I recommend to, to most folks, is to look for signs of woodpecker activity. Um, abnormally high woodpecker um, pecks or, or flaking all are really good signs that emerald ash borer may be present in that tree. Now, those woodpeckers are much better than we are at finding this insect. When you get a lot of woodpecker activity over time, you'll see this blonding effect where most of the outer bark of the tree has been chipped away um, by those woodpeckers. It's a sign that that's probably a fairly heavy infestation. And then of course, 
through time, we'll see die back in the tree and eventually tree death. Um, there are also some other signs, things like D-shaped exit holes that are created by the insect as they come out of the tree, the adults come out, um, or you'll also see apicormic shoots. Uh, these are little branches that the tree forms as a stress response. Those are indicators of EAB, but in my experience, they're not as reliable as, as these other signs and symptoms. So with respect to the, the biology of this bug, well, this time of the year, we'll start at the top because the insect is currently living as a larva. So this is the immature stage. If we were talking about moths or butterflies, we would talk, be talking about caterpillars, but that doesn't apply here. These are really flat, flattened larvae that are perfectly designed to feed right beneath the bark of the tree. And you can see that, that those larvae go through several developmental stages. And ideally, we'll spend the winter as an L4 or pre-pupa, what we call this J stage, where it's all curled up, nestled in a, in a cavity, created just in the outer hardwood um, where it's getting ready to form a pupa. And it will do that in the spring. And then in early summer and into July, we'll have emergence of those adults. Those adults will come out. They'll do a little bit of feeding on the foliage of the tree, which doesn't damage it much. And then they'll begin to lay their eggs in fissures and cracks within the bark. Now, normally, in most parts of North America, it takes one year for the insect to go through that cycle. But if the insect can't reach that pre-pupa stage before winter sets in, then it has to spend the whole summer as a larva, then it becomes a pre-pupa, and then it can complete the life cycle. So that version takes about two years, and that really does slow things down. And we see that two-year life cycle more commonly in Northern states. So in all of the work that's been done, not only my own research, but, but research in a number of different labs um, in both Canada and the United States, what we've learned is that as Emerald Ash Borer con continues to move into more and more Northern latitudes, its overall fitness decreases, which means that the females are smaller, they lay fewer eggs, and it also turns out that it's more likely that the insects are going to take up that full two years in order to develop and, and not do it as often in just one. And then, of course, my own work has shown, and the work of a few others, that extreme cold events really can cause some direct mortality of the insects. So what I've got a, in this slide is a photo of emerald ash borer larvae um, that were present in a green ash tree and we've stripped away the bark. And you can see that discoloration. It's a really good sign that those larvae were killed by the extreme cold that we had that winter. So I've been working on emerald ash borer since it showed up in 2009 in Minnesota. And I just have to acknowledge the many people who have helped make this work possible. Uh, Mark Abrahamson with the Minnesota Department of Ag has been instrumental uh, to this all of this research, but so has the work of several of my students. So Lindsay Christensen, um, Anthony Hansen, Dylan Tussey, all have been involved in helping unravel the mysteries of how emerald ash borer might, might make it through a really tough winter. And so I just wanted to quickly talk a little bit about how we go and measure some of the cold tolerance of, of this particular insect. So right now you're looking at an emerald ash borer and you're looking down the barrel of a syringe. And at the base of that syringe is a coil. Well, that coil is a thermocouple made of a couple of different metals, copper and constantin, um, but that allows us to actually measure the temperature of an individual insect. We take that insect, and the thermocouple, and we put it into a specially designed polystyrene cube. We put it down right in the middle, so it's fully insulated. And we take that bundle and we put it into a minus 80 degree centigrade freezer. And by doing so, what ends up happening is the insect cools at a very controlled rate. And we monitor the temperature of the insect once every second on our laptop. 
And this is just an example of the kind of data that we can collect from a single insect. So we start off at about room temperature and it gradually cools at that nice controlled rate. And all of a sudden some magic happens. And that sudden rise in temperature is what we call an exotherm. And for those of you who had high school chemistry or high school physics, you might remember what's going on here. What you're looking at is the phase change when um, liquids within the body of the insect become ice and go to solids. And so as that happens, those fluids begin to release heat and we see that as an increase in temperature. So that the lowest temperature that the insect gets to before that release of heat is the supercooling point. And for emerald ash borer, it turns out that when this insect begins to freeze, that's when it also begins to die. So we do that over and over and over again, and this is the kind of response that we see. And this is a very important figure. What this is showing is the degree of mortality or freezing that's caused by exposure to different cold temperatures in three different winters. And so there are a number of things that I really want you to pay attention to. The first part is that as you look at the left-hand side of this graph, where temperatures are a bit warmer, not much happens. The insects can survive sub-freezing temperatures just fine as long as they're just below freezing. But as we continue to cool the insect and we get down to around minus four degrees, then we start to see more insects succumbing to the cold beginning to freeze. It's once we get to around minus 20 Fahrenheit, which is roughly in this zone here, that we really start to see more interesting things happen. And that's roughly the temperature at which we see about 50% of the insects begin to freeze and die. And if we continue to cool more and more insects, what we'll find is that as you get down to about minus 30 Fahrenheit in this zone, well, now we're getting closer to 90% of the insects beginning to die. So it turns out that that zone from about minus 20 to minus 30 is where a lot of things of interest happen. And as you can see in this graph, things happen very quickly. So one degree, one way or the other, can make a big difference in how many emerald ash borer make it through the winter. Now that's all lab work. And we were all always been interested in whether or not that lab study uh, really translates well into the field. So many of you will remember the polar vortex that we had, the biggest one back in 2019. And my former student, Anthony Hansen, uh, generated this map based on the minimum temperature that winter. And what you can see is in all of those deep red areas, we would have expected that temperatures were cold enough to kill about 95% of the insects. And then other parts of the state, mortality would have been much less severe. Well, we wanted to see, was there any evidence to support that? So the Minnesota Department of Ag went around to three different parts of the state. They peeled the bark back off of some cut branches. And what they saw was a lot of this. They saw larvae that were discolored with this really brownish uh, coloration. This is not the sign of uh, a healthy larva. This is a really clear evidence that it's been injured by the cold. A, a healthy larva, which you can see in the lower picture is just a nice creamy yellow. But it turns out that not all insects that are damaged by cold will necessarily turn brown. And so an additional thing that we use, a different factor that we considered, was whether or not the insects had any sign of movement um, over the course of about two weeks. And so this was a great job for graduate students. Literally every day they went in and tickled the little larvae with a paintbrush. And if they never moved in that two week period, we felt pretty confident that they were dead. So the Department of Ag took those samples from Duluth, from Fort Snelling, and from Sauk Center. And what we were pleasantly surprised to see is that after they looked at many of them, that degree of winter kill was very close to what we had uh, projected. 
So in the Fort Snelling area here in the Twin Cities, we were looking at between 40 to 86% of the winter kill. In Duluth, it was higher, 67 to 89. And then at Sox Center, which was the coldest site where they collected samples, we were looking at close to 99% mortality. And again, those metrics are affected by whether we count just discolored larvae or both the larvae that were discolored and didn't move. But a really good sign that the lab work does translate very well to the field. So it's always important then when we talk about, well, what did a winter do to Emerald Ash Borer? There's always two parts to that equation. The first part is how ready was the insect for cold? How cold hardy did it get? And so what was the, the potential effect of cold on the insect? And of course, the other side is how much cold did those insects actually experience? And it's where those two pieces overlap that dictates the amount of mortality we would expect to see. We know there are a lot of things that affect um, overwintering temperatures for emerald ash borer. So air temperature is obviously the, the big driver, but, but also it turns out that the tree species that they're in, the size of the tree, whether that tree is in the sun or in the shade, the general habitat where that tree is located, its proximity to large structures like buildings, lakes, or rivers, and, and numerous other factors all influence how much cold those larvae might, might see. And so that starts to set up the premise for this current study because one of the things that's really interesting about cold air is that particularly when it's very calm out, the cold air almost acts more like a liquid. So at least the way I think about it. And it literally flows across the landscape. And it tends to move into these very low lying areas. And so the idea is that along the St. Croix Riverway, that's a naturally low area. So potentially it could be an area into which cold air would flow. Thus, emerald ash borer in that area would experience colder temperatures than outside the riverway. Conversely though, at the base of this, of this area, of course we have the river and the river is incredibly warm and probably goes without saying that during the winter that the river itself maintains a lovely balmy 32 degrees. And of course, 32 degrees is only balmy when it's almost minus 20 outside, but it's important, right? It's important to think about that potential warming effect that the river might have on the air and potentially then allow EAB to survive better than it would otherwise. So that was sort of the nature or the thought behind this setup. And I have to really go back in time a little bit and thank Byron Carnes um, because when he started hearing about the work that we were doing on Emerald Ash Borer and this potential that cold could be affecting the dynamics of this insect, he was clever enough to say, well, wait a minute. Uh, the National Park Service has several temperature recorders that are, they currently use during the summer to monitor temperatures within the St. Croix as a way to gauge what might be going on with zebra mussel. Well, those all come out of the river um, in the late fall. And so Byron said, why couldn't we just hang those up in trees? And I said, Byron, go for it. That's a great idea. And so for several years, uh, Byron and several folks that he's been working with, and I'll acknowledge a few in just a second, um, have made this temperature monitoring happen. It was really great this last year. I had the fortunate opportunity to go out with Katie Sickman um, from the Wild Rivers Conservancy and Caitlin McGorka, now with the National Park Service, who have really taken over a lot of this work. Um, and they have continued this overwintering monitoring. So what I'm gonna do, I'm not gonna talk about all the years of data that we've collected. I really just wanna focus on previous winter of 2021 to 2022. And so the study follows this basic design. So throughout the, the riverway, we have nine different study sites uh, where temperatures have been monitored. And that at each one of those sites, we have a pair of temperature recorders. Um, one is at a very high elevation, 
and then one is low, um, very close to the river. All of the sites have a southwest aspect um, to try and standardize some of that sun exposure. On each tree, then data loggers were placed on the south side of the tree. And what that does is it sort of gives us a sense of the maximum variation that we can see in temperature. When that sun comes out, it's remarkable how warm it can get. Uh, those data loggers were about four feet above the ground. And we end up looking at the temperatures that were collected from December 8th to about February 28th. Uh, remember, climatological spring begins March 1st, and so we stopped the, looking at the data on that last day of, of February. It turns out the data loggers were out a little longer than that, but we're just ignoring that for now. Those data loggers were recording the temperature once every hour, so we have a really robust data set, um, thanks to all, all the folks involved. And I want to just give a special shout out to Michael Rhodes with the National Park Service, because he was the one who actually had to download all of that information, process it before he handed it off to me. Now, I wasn't so sure how last winter was going to be. And of course, we're talking about the winter 2021 to 2022. And when I was just keeping an eye on things that year, in my world, it didn't get that cold. Uh, the airport was recording a temperature the coldest of about minus 17. And to me, that doesn't get that interesting with respect to thermal backdoor. Now, on campus, the St. Paul campus of the University of Minnesota, it got down to minus 20. And that's where we started to say, hey, um, maybe we're getting cold enough to begin to affect thermal dashboard, but it's still not that cold. Well, what did we see in, in this particular experiment? Well, I'm just gonna show a couple of sites as a particular example. What we're starting off with are all of the freezing temperatures that were recorded at the upland site uh, at Ferry Falls. And over the top of that now, I'm going to overlay those temperatures that were at the river. And I don't want you to spend a whole lot of time studying all of this. I know it's a really busy graph. What I want you to notice though, is all of the little orange tips on all of those peaks. All of the orange tips are telling you that the upland site was colder than the river site. And so a really good sign in that case that the, the river was actually helping keep things a bit warmer at Ferry Falls. Now, when we go to Osceola, we see a somewhat different pattern. So again, we're starting off with the upland site, and then we overlay the temperatures down by the river. And here, we don't see those little orange tips. In fact, this is a really good example where the river location was actually colder than the upland site. And I do want to highlight that in this particular place, this was our, our cold site for, of these two. And on January 26th, I hope you can see my pointer over here. This was our coldest day at this particular location where it got down to minus 25.6. So quite a bit colder than what we were seeing here in the heart of the Twin Cities. So are there any patterns that we can begin to see as we look across the different sites? Well, we can compare all of them going back and forth and just looking at the hourly difference in temperature we see that it really does depend on where you are at, uh, along the riverway um, over the course of the winter. And so some sites like Scotts Bridge and uh, the headquarters were quite a bit warmer uh, than at the river than at the upland site, but most other places were either colder or the same. Um, I do want to highlight that the Ferry Falls site was much, much warmer, um, but I think that that actually has to do with what was going on when temperatures at the face of the tree were above freezing. And I think it was actually quite a bit warmer there at the Ferry Falls location. So it's one of those things that we're still working on. But it turns out that those differences give us sort of a qualitative sense of what the river might be doing, but it's not necessarily the best indicator of how much mortality they, there could be. And so in our own work, and when we've done forecasting in the past, 
we tend to focus on the coldest day of the year. And so what this particular graph is showing across all of the study sites, what was the coldest temperature recorded either at the upland site or by the river? The first thing I'd like you to notice is that we've got a lot of variation among the nine, the nine sites where we were monitoring temperatures. So Scott's Bridge, the far northerly location, had an extreme low of minus 34, and we compare that to Ferry Falls that had a low of minus 23.6. The uh, river temperatures also showed a similar gradient from north to south, but then when we compare the, um, the pair of monitoring locations at a site, again, in some spots, three, um, the river provided a warmer climate than the upland site. But in most cases, in most cases, the river location was colder than the upland site. Now, those are air temperatures. And what we always want to caution people about is that the air temperature is not the temperature that Emerald, Emerald Asporer experienced. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this particular data set that was collected by Lindsay Christensen, all I want you to do is focus on the lower left-hand corner of each of these graphs. And all I want you to notice is that that line doesn't go right into the corner. So it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. And that bump in the underbark temperature is an indication of how much warming the tree itself provides. So when we account for that warming effect from the tree and thinking about the air temperatures, just looking at three sites that I thought were particularly interesting. So Scotts Bridge, way up north, the Danbury Thayers area, and then at Osceola. And I'm hoping that you can all see this, but when we translate that, we're seeing quite a bit of difference in the um, survivorship or at least potential survivorship of emerald ash borer at each of these places. So in the Scotts Bridge area, the, the river could have actually uh, or the, would have reduced mortality just a bit by about 7%. In the Danbury Thayers area, we're seeing uh, a fairly big increase in mortality of EAB. And then lastly at Osceola, again, the river is increasing that mortality. Uh, just well, actually quite a bit, quite a fair amount. We're still spending a lot of time working with this data and understand all of the lessons that it has to offer. And one of the other things, so that previous slide just looked at the coldest day of the year, but that doesn't tell the whole picture. So what this is looking at is time at different temperatures. And so we've got two spindles. This is for the upland site in the orangish color and the river site for Danbury Thayers. And the width of that spindle time in hours was spent at each of those temperatures. So as you compare those two blobs to one another, you'll see that um, the river site was colder for longer than the upland site. But ironically, the river site was also for longer than the upland site. And both of those things potentially could affect how much um, overwintering mortality we could expect to see from EAB. So just a few quick parting thoughts. Um, we did see that the winter low temperature did vary considerably along the whole St. Croix National Scenic Waterway. That was primarily affected by latitude, but the elevation or proximity to the river did sometimes also affect um, how much cold EAB might have experienced. The differences that we saw in that more in the low winter temperatures really could affect EAB, but it's important for me to emphasize that EAB is not fully present throughout the, the waterway. And so this would only be true if EAB got into all of those areas. The last parting thought that I wanted to share is that winter temps in parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin are going to 
slow the spread of emerald ash borer, but are probably not going to stop it completely. And so what we want to think about is how can we take advantage of these cold winter temperatures to help us manage EAB more effectively, um, but not overreact and realizing that these cold temperatures are helping to buy us time to come up with really solid and thoughtful management plans. And with that, I'd just like to wrap it up by thanking so many people involved. In fact, I have, I'm, if I've forgotten to mention you, I apologize. There have been so many people involved with this project through the years, but I just wanna have a big shout out to the National Park Service, to Wild Rivers Conservancy, and to the Minnesota Department of Agriculture for all of their work in helping us to understand the ecology of emerald ash borer. And then finally, just wanna make a plug for the Minnesota Invasive Terrestrial Plants and Pest Center. Please check out our website to learn more about the quality research that we're doing to help us better manage emerald ash borer and many other invasive species. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Rob, for the great presentation. Um, right now we've got about 20 minutes um, left for questions. So feel free to throw those in the chat and we'll read them out. Um, yeah, thank you, that was super interesting. I actually have a question I wanna ask while people um, still type the errors. Sure. Uh, one question I was thinking about is like, how long do the emerald ash borers need to be at those temperatures to uh, super cool and potentially die? That, that is a fantastic question. And it turns out they don't have to be at those temperatures for very long. Um, it's literally once they get to those critical temperatures for any amount of time, they can begin to freeze. Now we know the longer that they're at those killing temperatures, the more that will continue to freeze. So time does matter, um, but it doesn't take very long when it gets cold enough. That's encouraging. Well, while people are still typing, maybe I'll share another question that I often get. And that is whether or not wind chill matters. Because oftentimes, you know, it may not be necessarily that cold. Maybe it's minus 10 or minus 15, but that wind is howling. And so the wind chill dropped down to minus 25, minus 30. It turns out it's a bit more complicated than you might think, but the, the quick and dirty is that it doesn't matter that much. So it's really what the absolute air temperature is. That's what drives how much mortality is going to happen. But what is important is that that wind really cools off the tree much more quickly than if there wasn't any wind blowing at all. So it's not gonna get colder than that minus 10 or minus 15, whatever the real temperature is, but it can sure help the insects get down to whatever that real temperature is. That's really interesting. Um, and while you're answering that, we had a question come in. So I'll read that out to you real quick. Um, so Amy S. asks if there is any evidence that the emerald ash borer can adapt to colder temperatures over time or lifetimes. So there are a couple of different ways to think about that particular question, and it's a good one. So one of the things that we worry about is that if it does get cold, but not so cold that it I and mean, there still need to be some survivors, but then do those survivors, are they the super cold tolerant ones so that their offspring are more adapted or better adapted to living in the cold? In our work on emerald ash borer, we don't see a strong evidence for that to happening. We're still on the lookout for it, but we don't yet see that occurring. What we think is that this insect is naturally what we call very plastic. And so that with its stock physiology, that it can withstand a wide range of temperatures and that that physiology really hasn't been changed by its exposure to winters in Minnesota or Wisconsin. Okay. 
Interesting. Let's see. Only question in the chat for now, but I have a lot of questions actually um, from when you were uh, doing your presentation. So uh, one of the main things I was thinking about while watching that um, is management actions. And if there's any like leading um, management actions you like to take when it comes to Emerald Ash Borer. Um, is there any way to save a tree once it's been infested as well? Yeah, that's a really good question as well. So it, it really does depend a lot on the site conditions and where exactly that tree happens to be. Um, if it's a city tree, uh, there are a lot, the, probably the most options available there. Um, the first is to have the tree removed. That's, that's the best way because you're assured that you're killing the emerald ash borer. And so that helps to stop spread and infestation of other trees, as long as everybody is being very aggressive about that. Of course, that means that you're losing a tree and many homeowners are really disappointed by that particular option. Insecticides um, are a viable strategy. And there are a number of products that can be injected into the base of the tree. And we found those to be very effective. Now, you want to be very careful about any time that insecticides are being used because you want to think about the product and other insects that might be affected. So through the Minnesota Invasive Terrestrial Plants and Pest Center, Dr. Brian Akama um, has found that uh, a product known as azadiractin and another one known as emamectin benzoate have both provided really high quality control of emerald ash borer and have protected trees. The other thing that they have found is that you don't necessarily have to treat every tree. Um, it's a form of what's known as associational protection. It's part of the reason that we're all encouraged to get flu shots, but not everybody does. And it turns out that the more people that do get a flu shot, those that don't still get some protection because we're not passing the virus around. And so the same thing happens in trees that are treated. Um, you can lower that overall pressure from emerald ash borer and help out those trees that haven't been treated. Um, some of those might also work in more natural areas, but in natural sites, we're also relying very heavily on biological control. And that's a third strategy that the Minnesota Department of Ag and folks in Wisconsin are also employing little tiny wasps that are specific, they sting the emerald ash borer and will lay an egg into it, and then they develop and in the process kill that, uh, that larva. Well, that's really cool. Um, I, I'd never heard of the bees before doing that. So that's incredible, actually. Um, thank you for providing a little bit of hope in that respect as well um, for managing the emerald ash borer. Um, sure. While you were answering that, we got a couple more questions. So uh, Amy S. asks if there is any evidence of emerald ash borer affecting other trees besides those in the Fraxinus gen uh, genus. So that's, a, that's also a really good question. There's one example, and it really is not so relevant um, in the Northern US, but the white fringe tree is a popular ornamental and it's also in the olive family where Fraxinus occurs. And it's also proven to be susceptible to emerald ash borer, but none of our other hardwoods um, are susceptible to EAB. And of course, none of our, our softwoods are either. Another question we got was from John Goodfellow, and he asks if 90% winter mortality obviously suppresses pest uh, pest pressure, but does it matter longer term? In other words, what is the effect of 10%? 10% um, of a lot of bugs is, is still bad. Uh, does this just delay mortality and loss of an entire population? That, yeah, I can clarify more if needed. No, no, I get it. And that's a question that I also get a fair amount of the time. So it turns out that when you're starting to see 90% mortality and remembering that not every one of those insects makes it from an egg all the way to an adult or a number of other things that come into play, um, that around 90% mortality 
causes that population to stay fairly stable through time. And if you're not having a growing population, it turns out that the ash trees themselves can respond to some of that injury, begin to heal themselves, and uh, may not succumb um, very quickly at all. In other cases where we're starting to see that 50 to 90% mortality, that's when you're starting to see the populations building, albeit somewhat slowly through time. And so those are the cases where um, you probably may see some uh, ash tree mortality, but it's not gonna happen overnight. And that's one of the things is that you really wanna be careful about not overreacting. We wanna be very thoughtful about that. Now, if you're getting less than 50% mortality, which happens in pockets of Southern Minnesota, absolutely in Southern Wisconsin, the discussion about winter cold really doesn't matter. And we have to rely or think about other things that might be used to kill emerald ash borer. Cold is not gonna do it. And then another question from Kathy Wenling is, did you test any wetland sites? We have tested wetland sites to look at um, how or what are the temperatures that emerald ash borer is actually experiencing. And so we've looked at black ash in those wetland sites. And we did find that that microclimate is incredibly unique. Um, and in those particular cases, the parts of the tree that were closest to the surface of the wetland, um, those were actually quite a bit warmer through the winter. Okay, um, that's all for the questions in the chat right now. Um, I had another question um, specifically about the woodpeckers and if there's been any studies on the impact of the woodpeckers on the emerald ash borer populations. Is oh, it making no. a dent? <laughs> it does make a dent. Uh, boy, woodpeckers absolutely love emerald ash borer. And in fact, they're probably the number one cause of mortality, um, particularly as EAB is moving uh, further west. And so they're very good at finding it. In some cases, I've seen reports that they can kill 60, and in some cases, up to 80% of the larvae, which is great. But there are a couple of things to think about. So one is that it turns out woodpeckers need a little time to learn that EAB is in the area. Um, and that, that, I think, happens just a little bit by dumb luck. But the other part is that we keep trying to figure out how is it exactly that the woodpeckers find EAB in the first place? At some times of the year, we think that they, the woodpeckers might be able to sense some of the vibrations as EAB are feeding underneath that bark. They're, they're creating little vibrations that the birds can pick up on and they can sense it that way. There's also a question about whether or not they can use acoustics and basically the sound that's created over that gallery and perhaps find uh, the insects that way as well. That's really cool. Nature is truly amazing, um, isn't it? That's amazing. Um, and another question came up in the chat. So Brady Sidolta, uh, Sidola, apologies. Um, how much effect could a natural predator have on the population as opposed to woodpeckers, which you, which you mentioned make a large dent? So that becomes the hard part is that once we start to think about other things that might either uh, prey upon emerald ash borer or um, kill it like a fungal infection, there's not a lot that's out there. Um, so we think about things like could spiders potentially eat adult insects? We don't have any evidence that that's a particularly strong driving factor. Some new research does say that there are some fungi that can attack emerald ash borer. They, we think they're more generalist fungi. Um, the, the work is still going on in that area, but it's unclear exactly how much mortality those fungi are causing. So outside of woodpeckers, you know, and every once in a while I've seen sites where even like, oh, a porcupine will start tearing the bark off, trying to get at, at insects. 
Um, but none of those are really going to be a very effective approach at regulating uh, emerald ash borer populations. Great. Thank you so much, Rob, uh, for your presentation today. Um, and thank you to all of our participants who joined us. Please take a moment before you go and grab the survey link out of the chat. Your responses go towards helping us create great programming like the Lunch and Learn you saw today. To learn more about Wild Rivers Conservancy and view our upcoming events, please visit us at our website, wildriversconservancy.org. To be sure you do not miss another event, please sign up on our homepage to receive our e-news. We thank you for attending and a special thank you to you, Rob. Um, have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you all. Thanks so much, Rob.